Um, how do insects injure plants? We pretty much all know this. Uh, that thing's moving here? Yeah. All right. They chew leaves, stems, or barks. They suck sap, or they bore into um, the bark, stems, or twigs. They cause galls. What's a gall? It's like a growth, right? It's like a tumorous growth. Um, sometimes you'll see them as a plant, as a tree grows, or uh, it grows up and then something bores into it and it grows this kind of tumor, I guess, on the, the, outside of the, tree. On the outside of the tree. Sometimes on the outside, sometimes it's the whole stem turns into a gall. Sometimes it's just kind of notches around. So um, they cause galls, they attack roots, they lay eggs in tissue, they nest, uh, and then they carry or harvest other insects or pathogens. This is not any news for anybody, right? They do all these things. But how do they do these things, right? How do they help plants? Well, of course, they pollinate. They produce products. <laughs> That's a tough one. They produce products like honey. Um, biological uses biological controls, so you use those ladybug beetles. Um, Decompose materials, they break down leaf materials so that you have nutrients in your soil. And uh, they do soil improvement, of course, by bo boring in and aerating soil, among other things. Many, many things they do for benefit. Well, let's learn about how they do things to plants that we don't like. Come on, man. Where's my tree? There it is. Mouth parts. I'm going to try to make this so that we can see. Ooh, there's even audio. Yeah, it's too technical. But anyway, here we go. All right. Intro. Start. OK. Insects chew on plants, right? Mm -hmm. Well, many insects have, or insects all have different kinds of mouth parts, um, which usually dictates the approach that you're going to take for treatment on uh, for any sprays or anything like that. So you really need to understand that based upon its mouth part, we can really come up with a treatment plan. And it doesn't really have to be sp too specific as far as the species of the insect, but really what kind of mouth part it has, and then we can address it. So we can use things like neem oil, which is um, keeps bugs off. Well, how does that work? Well. It puts a nice layer of oil on the outside of the plant, and as chewing um, insects will come along and start consuming that, it tastes bad, they don't like it. Well, if sucking insects come along, they don't really care because they're not consuming the outside of the plant, they're consuming the juices on the inside of the plant. So neem really doesn't really work for sucking, plant, or sucking insects, but I'll explain that right here. So we have um, chewing. That's a post mentor and all that good stuff. So you have chewing. Uh, it's going to have, <clears throat> if you ever wondered what these are on an, on an insect, they always have the little hands in the, the little. It's because um, insects have, of course, evolved from a more primitive kind of insect, millipede type of an insect that had many, many, many legs. and. So each section of that millipede insect had a leg. Um, insects have, over time, shrunk down, but those sections still exist. Those are the plates on the sides of an insect. So um, as they've evolved, they've squished together. Some of the legs have disappeared off the back of, of the insects, down to six. And then um, some of the legs up in near the front of the head have disappeared, but four of them have stayed. 
So these were actually evolutionary, evolutionarily, these were legs in the beginning. And then they've evolved to move up towards the face and then they facilitate um, pushing materials in. So if you don't believe in evolution, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so, uh, so we have the chewing kind, right? These are gonna be ones that actually rip apart cells and uh, consume leafy, um, waxy material on the outside of leaves and stems. Also roots, they chew on roots. Ground beetle, okay? This is going to be something, you're gonna be able to identify a mouth part on an insect as a predator very, very easily. So if it looks like the mandibles, um, the front mouth part of the insect is meant to grab, harness, and then squeeze or crush, then chances are it's a predator. So um, dragonflies, certainly gonna be a predator. Um, uh, ladybird beetles and all these things. You can really identify them by the large mandibles that they have in front. These are to hold onto potential prey. So that's where you see on the ground beetle, you have that really, really large pinchers in the front. That's gonna be indication of a insect that eats other insects. Why would you kill a predator in your field? You don't wanna kill the predators. The predators are the good ones. They're the ones that are eating all the bad ones. So if you find that your whole tree is covered with predators, yay. <laughs> Leave it alone. Exactly. So if you're going to spray out seven into the field and just kind of just broadcasting all over the place, you're going to kill everything that's bad. Okay. So I, the goal of this is really for you guys to understand, to identify which ones are potentially bad for plants. So certainly that grasshopper, you know, plague a locust, right? Um, who do we got next? Ooh, there's a, that dragonfly naiad. So this is going to be pretty rare to see in the animal community or the insect community. Um, it's only found in aquatic uh, insects and the larvae of dragonflies, of course, stay in water. You're not gonna see this in your field too much. If you do see these types of mouth parts in your field, it means you got way too much water in your field. If you're not a cow farmer, then you need to do something about that. But that's how it works. It's basically got a shield that goes out and just scoops up material and brings it back to the face. But as this is not really all that important for farmers, I'm going to keep going. Honeybee. So honeybees have something like, uh, come on, show me, man. There it is. So. You saw where on the grasshopper it had those fingers on the side and the mandibles and the, the promate on the bottom. What has happened with honeybees is they've evolved to have all of those different things evolve into just simple tongue-like structures. So this is, is gonna be like anywhere between, I think it's six, six organelles that are very, very similar to each other. And this is a lapping. So what they do is they just basically stick their, tongue, their, their tongues in and they lap up nectar, right? And that helps in the pollination. So if you saw an insect on your, in your field that has lapping, would you kill that bug? No, that's a pollinator. <laughs> so you need to identify it by its mouth part, right? They show a mosquito they show a mosquito in this, but just like mosquito, there are bugs that will pierce into a plant structure in the same way the mosquito pierces into the human skin. Okay? Um, not really an agriculture pest, but very, very, very important to identifying the sucking bugs because if you can identify the mouth part on a sucking bug, chances are that's going to be a pest. Okay, so they usually will poke into the, the plant and they cause disease and they cause open wounds and really, really bad stuff. So the structure there is, has those, those hands, right? Right up front. And then there's actually a sheath here. And that's one of the organelles that had evolved of the six 
into a shield that goes over the, um, the needles. And on the inside, there are five needles. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, there's five. There's six. Right. OK, so there's six. So these, this is a, just a shield. It's like a casing for it. And then one, two, three, four, five, six. Of the, all those organelles have turned into just piercing, sucking tubes. Okay? All sucking insects have, have this, where they have a case around it. And then they actually open it up and use it to stick in. And then they put the case back over top. Actually, they do. Because, because all insects have the same amount of organelles in their face the same number, but they've just evolved into different structures. So they all had a relative that had six structures up front that they, at one point, all shared that relative, right? And then they've evolved since then. Or is it seven? Seven structures up front. OK? So you have many, many different kinds, right? Oh, wait, where is the mosquito? So they ingest liquid food. And then, of course, we got our wonderful butterflies. Now, this is a touchy subject, right? They're pollinators, but their larvae tend to decimate crops for the most part. So you got a lot of mostly moths. They will feed on green leafy crops. And um, some butterflies as well. But they're caterpillars. Man, caterpillars, you've seen that you can wipe out an entire plant in a day. They can eat something like 300 times their weight in a week. So this is the mouth part that you would typically see on a butterfly. It just uncurls, sucks out the nectar, and then curls back up. The problem is, is can you pair this up with its larvae and figure out if the larvae is your problem? So if you see a lot of butterflies or moths in your field, you really need to do your homework to find out where do those butterflies lay their larvae and what does it eat. Okay. If you go out there and you see monarch butterflies and you know that they only eat milkweed and they pollinate, then not a big deal. You like them. But if you see cabbage butterflies everywhere, this is a bad problem. Okay. And of course, one of my favorite, I love flies. They're so fascinating because they're so nasty. <laughs> God, they're the grossest creatures ever. Um, look at their eyes. I mean, talk about evolution, man. And we're talking about insects and evolution. They're called diptera. Uh, diptera meaning two wings. So they're the only insects that have two wings. All other insects have four wings. They have a front and a back wing. But only flies have two. So it's real easy in identifying without the mouth part to see if you have a diptera, a problem. Now, <clears throat> these usually aren't a problem for um, plants. Why? Because of their mouth part. Anybody seen the movie The Fly? Uh, what, what? Both of them, the new one with, I like the one with Jeff Goldblum. He, uh, and what, he like eats a Twinkie and then he throws it up and then he eats it again. Well, that's kind of what they do, right? What they do is, <clears throat> When, it's, when this mouth structure is up in the face, um, it's held here by a shield. And there's actually like a, a digestive uh, structure on the inside that has lots of juices and enzymes. And it's essentially like a stomach that breaks down material before it goes into the gut. So it's like one of its many stomachs. And what it does is it takes it out of the face turns that stomach inside out and slaps down and picks up stuff and then it brings it back in and then it consumes it. So when a fly lands on you, it instantly will start doing that, sucking up your sweat. It's so nasty. Um, but at the same time, this would not negatively affect the plant for the most part. It would just be kind of sucking up the juices on the outside, right? So if you see diptera, not usually a problem in the adult phase. In the pupa phase, definitely something, or not the pupa, the larvae phase. Um, 
maggots, uh, lots of bad things can happen to roots when it comes to flies. Anybody know what a blowfly is? You guys have them in Hawaii, um, but they only a problem for cattle. Um, <clears throat> they have them in South America that are problems for humans. What they do is, no, they're, they're really unique because they have a symbiotic relationship with mosquitoes. So what they do is they will um, go over to a puddle where there's mosquito larvae, lay their eggs on the surface of the water. As the larvae, the mosquito larvae come up and start pupating and then they turn into a mosquito right there on the surface of the water. And as it comes and emerges through, the eggs which it has laid on the surface get on the head structure of the adult mosquito. The adult mosquito will then fly away and then land on, um, we'll use the South American ones that will land on a human and as the mosquito starts to prepare the skin and, and uh, to poke in, the egg will actually slide off and land into the hole that the mosquito had poked. And it will bore itself in there. And then it will sit inside there and create enzymatic juices that kills off the cells of the host. So like a guy in, in South America I know had one in his head. And, um, it slowly kills off the skin around there, and it grows to a grub, which is about this big. Nasty, nasty grub. Isn't it called a bot fly? Bot fly, sometimes? No, blow fly. They call it blow fly. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, that's bot fly, too. They do do that as well. And th those are actually, bot flies will have... Um, so they're long like that, too, and they bore in the head? Yeah, they have uh, like a snorkel that sticks out of the hole so it can breathe. Nasty things, man. That's why flies are awesome. I think they're just the grossest things in the world that they're fascinating. So anyway, I don't want to get off this tangent here. So we have mouse structures. So part of our activity today is going to take your insects, you're going to put them under the microscope, and you're going to identify which mouth part it has. Okay, And you're going to tell us what it is and why. OK? What would you say? All right. So who do I kill or prevent from? <laughs> Not the beneficials. Use proper identification as a key. And let's look at this link I got here. Oh. Aha, this is a write-up by Ted Radovich. Um, I'm going to stick to that spot where I was at. Where was I? Pest control. There you go. Ah, there it is. So, a list of beneficial uh, microorganisms. Ted actually sells or makes available these wonderful cards that are laminated cards that he can send to you um, that have pictures and ways to identify beneficial my, uh, insects. So this is a list that, he, that is on there, and you can click on each one of these. You'll have this on the link, um, and you can really get a, a nice write-up on how to sustain these, these insects. How do you get lady beetles to come to your property? You can go check that out and talk to Ted all you want about this. Okay, so he is an extension agent, and he will have to take your call. Now, he is the only organic guy at CTAR, so very, very busy, so plan ahead, okay? But what it comes down to is there's the list. Um, okay, moving on. Only the bad ones, right? Be very subjective. And let's take a look at the link I have here. That uh, cicada I had up there in that picture. Man, you see those in your property, you better do something about it. Cicada? It's so funny. It's like what most people know is a cicada is not actually a cicada. What is this? Oh, this is that knowledge master I showed you in the last class. And it allows you to do pest searches by crop. 
uh, by best pet type or by scientific name. It's not all that detailed, but it gives you a chance. You know, like what would what would be the common pest found in macadamia nuts? Well, it's a lot. Disease pathogen problem. So then you can go to this website. If you find yourself, you have any of these, you, it helps you to identify um, the bad insects. Do your research. Don't just go out spraying stuff. <laughs> How do I kill them? Well, you have organic versus conventional. Two very similar approaches with drastically different results. Organic insect management methods. OK. Floating row covers, mobile pet, mobile pests, floating row covers. Um, so this is basically just like, like netting, <coughs> that netting that you can bring around. Uh, a lot of folks will do this on ginger. Um, it's very expensive, don't recommend it, but it is effective. Uh, pheromone traps work really well. Corn earworms, diamondback moth. Two bugs that cause major problems for farmers in Hawaii. Um, the corn earworm for corn farmers and Pakalolo farmers. God, do they hate that thing. Um, and then diamondback moth, that pretty much affects trees, crops, everything. And what it does is the larvae bores into the plant and it just kills it off. So coffee farmers is a major, major problem. Um, sticky traps work pretty good for white flies, fungus gnats, and mealybugs. Insectual, insecticidal soap uh, is great for mites, aphids, and white flies, anything with a soft body. Okay? They make safety soap, which is uh, like an organic insecticide soap. I use just, just plant-based dish soap. Works really, really, really well. Why does that work? Well, what happens is the soap will actually get on the outside of the bug. The water will eventually evaporate and the soap stays and it clings to the exoskeleton of the insect and then when the insect tries to molt it can't get out of its house. So it sits there and grows inside of its exoskeleton, can't get itself off and then they pop, right? Just soap. Regular old soap. Dawn, well, Dawn is, a, um, is, is petroleum based so I would recommend using a plant but actually, it works better than the other one. It just has, I don't like, I don't like giving my money to Don. So it's like, I don't want them to exist anymore. Palm olive, they should all die. Um, I make my own soap. <laughs> I do, I make my own soap, and it's much easier. Uh, oil sprays uh, for aphids. This would be like uh, neem oil. Aphids, beetles, caterpillars, strips, and bees. Okay, If you're using an oil spray, you're probably going to kill some bees today. So stop. <laughs> Use neem and that kind of thing as a last resort. Right? Biological um, natural sprays. Um, so I will use something like um, LAB, which is lactic acid bacteria. So I will make, I'll take milk, mix it with some rice wash water. So the milky water that's left over after you wash your rice. Um, through a process, I mix those together and I make curds and whey. So I get cottage cheese on top and I get this yellow material in the middle, which is the whey. So after milk separates, and then that whey is uh, la full of lactic acid bacteria, which I'll give a little bit of sugar for some energy. And then I use that as a foliar spray because it's an antifungus, it's an antifungal. Um, it basically robs the f any fungus that's on the surface of a plant of its nutrient source because it takes over that area and usually consumes the nutrients much faster than the other organism can. So it just basically starves out anything that's on the outside of the plant. But it also does a really good job of deterring insects because it stinks. It smells like rotten milk. And so <clears throat> you can actually get out there on your plants, and if it looks like you have caterpillars or that kind of thing, um, spray it on there once, they will all jump off. They will all leave, and they will not go near that plant for at least three days. So, being that it's natural and organic, you do have to go out and do multiple applications, but what did it cost you? At a 1,000 to 1 dilution ratio, one gallon of milk, you could do like a year. <laughs> you could have enough lab for a year. So did they get the natural tree farm, right? That's the stuff they use for there. It's the same stuff. Why does that 
why does that help the pigs? Well, like I said, it consumes all the nutrient source for any microorganism. So if there is a sulfur consuming uh, nutrient source on the pig, which is usually that black microorganism you see on, on the side of the pig, you spray that right on, it eats off all the, or all the food source for the microorganism, eats up all the sulfur, and then that microorganism dies off within a couple hours of sitting in the sun. So, so the nutrients that you don't have to make your own can go to the environment. I don't speak that language. <laughs> why wouldn't you make it yourself? <laughs> it's a why. So you can go buy it in a plastic bottle and then throw that away, and then all these birds die, right? I'm s people need to get back to being part of the land and with the land and with your chemicals and with your amendments. Just going to the store to buy things. Ah! I stopped going to the grocery store a month ago. I don't go to the grocery store anymore. I don't buy anything from a grocery store. I buy everything from farms or I make it myself. And so it's like... On one of your stuff, you should put a recipe on how to do that. Yeah, or I could do a workshop and charge a ton of money for that too. <laughs> It's not like, I mean, it's not like I'm just like, this thing's just come to me. I've spent like a lot of time researching on how to exist outside of a grocery store. It's really difficult, but it's so much cheaper. We spend like $100 where we would spend $600 at the grocery store. It's incredible. Now that you're moving down to Phoenix, yes. what kind of soil do you have down there? Um, uh, the, guy, the guy who owns the property, he brought in soil about 10 years ago. Uh, so I got about two and a half feet of really, really rich soil. Yeah. Have you been in some of the natural areas down here? You get really nice mulch on the forest soil and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So yep. Soil's volcanic. Yeah. Right? Got to watch pathogens, though, when you're bringing yeah. soil from one area to another. Okay, getting on. Um, microorganisms. Using things like uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, I also use Bacillus subtilis, which is a really great bacteria that you use. You put into a, a foliar spray, and what it does is an antifungicide. So basically, the bacteria consumes the uh, hyphae of the fungus. <clears throat> so you're using bacteria to kill a fungus. It's really, it's really nice. You can actually buy this type stuff um, at BEI and uh, at the hydroponic stores and there's a, at the hydroponic store over by the Toyota dealership they sell Bacillus subtilis in a one gallon jug it's a hundred dollars it will last you at least two years and it's cheaper than any fun fungicide you're going to buy at a hundred dollars for a gallon um, and all you do is every once a month you maybe throw a handful of sugar in the container to make sure those bacteria stay alive and then you just use it as will. Um, really great for caterpillars, cabbage worms, and earworms. Um, parasitic nematodes. These are not commonly used in Hawaii because Hawaii has problems with bringing in animals. Uh, but in the mainland, <coughs> people use parasitic nematodes all over their farms. They put it, basically they, they take these nematodes that they buy in a, in a liquid and then they, um, dilute it and then they'll spray it all over on their fields and sometimes in their horse um, stables and stuff and, and what it does is the nem these nematodes will um, consume nasty materials, start breaking down things really, really quickly. Also the parasitic nematodes will um, get on other insects, which is what I'm mentioning here. So if you spray parasitic nematodes around your horse stable, um, and all the horse flies, well, chances are the liquid gets on them and they actually start boring into the, to the insect itself and kill the insect. So um, parasitic nematodes, very, very effective, but just not used a lot in Hawaii. Right, Davey? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you can use conventional methods, which are hideous, awful, toxic, carcinogenic <laughs> poisons that kill everything. <laughs> You want to learn about that stuff, take another class. <laughs> Disease control management. All right, guys. This is the, does that beep? Am I hearing things? Still hear me? Blah, blah, blah. OK. Types of plant diseases. There are fungi, which is the plural for fungus, right? 
bacteria and viruses. Fungi. <laughs> 